It's the autumn of 1918, the fourth year of World War I. The Ottoman Empire's forces are completely routed in Palestine and Transjordan and are in full retreat. But the British are right behind them, capturing thousands as they sweep through southern Syria and the Golan Heights. As they close in on Damascus, the Yantan forces are joined by Prince Faisal, T.E. Lawrence, and the troops from the Arab Revolt. By September 29, 1918, the Ottomans have abandoned Damascus and it's just a matter of who will claim the city. And now, the ironies of wartime politics become reality. According to the Sykes-Picot Agreement, France would take control of Syria and Damascus. However, the single largest group in Damascus were Sunni Arabs. General Edmund Allenby, commander of Great Britain's Egyptian forces, was concerned how the Damascenes might perceive a European Christian army occupying this great ancient city. He preferred if the city was officially conquered by an Arab Muslim. And who better than Prince Faisal? Basically, the British wanted Prince Faisal to pretend he captured Damascus. By the way, this will not be the last time the British used the Arabs for their political trickery. When Prince Faisal arrived on October 3rd, the British allowed him to enter the city as if he was a conquering hero. Meanwhile, the French bit their tongue and went along with the game. As mentioned in an earlier episode, Prince Faisal and his father already knew about Sykes-Picot. They had known at least since November 1917 when the Bolsheviks exposed the deal. However, Prince Faisal hoped things might change once the fighting was done and it was time to negotiate. He hoped the British would ignore their promises to the French while keeping their promises to him. He hoped the success of the Arab revolt might sway the British to support his claims against the French. And he hoped to avoid dealing with the French at all because he did not trust them. Prince Faisal was a fool. After the celebrations were over and the speeches had been made, General Allenby and T.E. Lawrence met with Prince Faisal at a Damascus hotel to let him know what was going to happen next. General Allenby explained that due to the Balfour Declaration, the Arabs would have no role in Palestine. He went on to explain that due to the Sykes-Picot Agreement, the Arabs would have no role in Lebanon and Syria. Prince Faisal argued and pleaded, but to no avail. Naturally, he felt betrayed and cheated. Prince Faisal stormed out of Damascus, taking several units from his Arab army with him. They went to Beirut in Lebanon and occupied the city. He hoisted the flag of the Arab revolt, which ironically was designed by the man who betrayed him, Mark Sykes. France responded by sending warships to Beirut and prepared to attack Faisal. French troops even landed on the shores of Lebanon, ready to storm the city. Hoping to avoid an embarrassing international incident, General Allenby intervened, sending British Indian troops into Beirut. They finally convinced Prince Faisal to lower his flag and leave the city to the French. With the fall of Damascus, the truth became obvious. The Ottoman Empire was on the losing side of this war and the end was near. On October 8th, 1918, the young Turks resigned from the cabinet. The three Pashas, Enver, Tolat, and Jamal, all fled the country knowing they could be tried for war crimes. And on October 30th, 1918, Ahmed Ezad Pasha signed the armistice, effectively ending the war for the Ottoman Empire. The Treaty of Versailles officially ended the war between the Entente powers and Germany. However, the Treaty of Sevres, signed in August 1920, officially ended the war between the Entente powers and the Ottoman Empire. Among other things, the Treaty of Sevres carved up the Ottoman Empire, not just the Middle East, but also Anatolia, the traditional homeland of the Turkish people. The lands outside of Anatolia were placed under various allied mandates. In theory, the allies were to govern these territories until they were ready for self-rule. Great Britain received a mandate over Mesopotamia, which included the oil-rich region of Mosul down to Basra on the Persian Gulf. Britain also got a mandate over Palestine, allowing them to continue fulfilling the terms of the Balfour Declaration. 
France received a mandate over Syria. Finally, Sharif Hussein was given the strip of land running along the Arabian Red Sea coast, starting from the Gulf of Aqaba and ending near the border of Yemen. This land included the holy cities of Mecca and Medina and was called the Kingdom of Hejaz. Prince Faisal was not yet ready to give up on Syria. Before we discuss his next moves, let's understand a few things. First, with the exception of the Maronite Christians, most Arabs in Syria wanted nothing to do with France. They might have tolerated a British mandate, but they despised the French. Second, even though most Syrian Arabs did not like the French, there were different levels to this. There were Syrian nationalist politicians who wanted complete, immediate, unconditional independence. And then there were moderate politicians, mostly former Arab officials of the Ottoman government who wanted to wait and see. They did not want a French mandate either, but they took a more pragmatic approach and were willing to work with France. The third thing to understand is the Prime Minister of France, George Clemenceau was the rare French politician that hated French imperialism. He was an isolationist and did not like wasting French blood and money in foreign lands. Finally, not all Westerners agreed with a French mandate over Syria. American President Woodrow Wilson, for instance, had made it clear he did not support taking land from one empire and giving it to another. There were also many high-ranking British officials who supported Prince Faisal's claim to Syria. They liked Prince Faisal and preferred him in Syria instead of the French. One of Prince Faisal's biggest supporters was his friend, T.E. Lawrence. T.E. Lawrence tried his best to convince the British cabinet to honor their promises to Faisal. However, the British Foreign Office had the final word, and they decided their written promises to France held more weight than their spoken promises to the Arabs. Prince Faisal did try to work with the French. After a lengthy discussion with Prime Minister George Clemenceau, the two men came to an understanding. Faisal would rule Syria with a high level of autonomy. However, he would still be subject to French oversight. This worked out well for both parties. Prince Faisal would get to run Syria almost independently, and George Clemenceau, the isolationist, could avoid more French imperialism. However, the French political establishment and the French public did not feel the same way. France loved French imperialism. In January 1920, George Clemenceau resigned as prime minister. Like most French people, his replacement, Alexander Millerand, loved imperialism and made it clear France would rule Syria as it pleased. Prince Faisal had another problem. The Syrian nationalists back home rejected his arrangement with George Clemenceau and continued to demand immediate, unconditional independence. Faisal tried to warn them that this would bring conflict with the French, but the Syrian politicians refused to listen. So Faisal tried to play both sides. Publicly, he joined with the nationalists in demanding Syria's independence, but privately, he worked with the moderates to ratify his deal with Clemenceau. When the Syrian nationalists realized what was happening, they quickly proclaimed the independent Arab kingdom of Syria and named Faisal as their new king. The French had their hands full with Mustafa Kemal and the Turks in Anatolia and could not respond to these developments in Syria. Faisal took advantage of this situation and went along with the nationalists. He declared his brother, Prince Abdullah, king of Iraq. Then he sent delegates to Palestine and Mesopotamia to inform the British officials that they were trespassing on sovereign territory. The British were furious with Faisal for declaring independence and dragging Iraq and Palestine into his scheme. To teach him a lesson, the British supported their French ally against their Arab ally. At first, France was too busy with Mustafa Kemal in southern Turkey to focus on Syria. France's military was already overextended and they could not fight both Kemal to the north and Faisal to the south. So they made a decision. On May 10, 1920, 
the French commander in Anatolia concluded a truce with Mustafa Kemal, giving him full control of southern Turkey. Then they turned their attention to Faisal in Syria. The French sent Faisal an ultimatum, ordering him to step down. With France threatening war, King Faisal tried to convince the nationalists to reconsider their declaration of independence. But the Syrians refused to listen and even threatened to overthrow Faisal themselves if he kept on talking like this. Finally, Faisal offered to surrender to the French, but by then, it was too late. The French ignored him and the Franco-Syrian war was underway. It was all over pretty quickly. Syria did not have the political, financial, nor military structure to field a real army. And they were outnumbered by the French who were supplemented by 17,000 Senegalese soldiers. By July 26, 1920, the French had subdued most of Syria. Two days later, they arrested Faisal and exiled him to Iraq. Prime Minister Alexander Milleron proclaimed, Syria is French. All of it forever. By the summer of 1920, nothing was working out for the British in the Middle East. In Anatolia, the Turks did not seem to understand they had lost the war and were fighting against their occupation. In Iraq, several tribes had revolted against British rule. By the time the British regained control in February 1921, over 450 of their citizens had been killed. And now, trouble was brewing in Transjordan. Soon after France exiled Prince Faisal to Iraq, there were reports that his representatives were seen in Transjordan. Not too long after that, they learned his brother, Prince Abdullah, was also in Transjordan with a small military force. This was a troubling development for Great Britain. If France thought the Hashemite brothers were up to something, they might use it as an excuse to invade Transjordan. Faisal insisted his brother was only in Transjordan to recover from some illness. The British were skeptical and believed Abdullah was planning to attack Syria. This was getting to be too much for Great Britain. They had to get the Middle East under control. They had to get Iraq to settle down. They had to keep the Hashemite brothers out of trouble. And they had to keep France from invading Transjordan. And so, the British organized a conference. The Cairo Conference of 1921 was mostly a reaction to the violence in Iraq. Great Britain wanted to figure out why the violence happened and how to keep it from happening again. The first thing they did was create a new Arab legislative body in Iraq called the Council of Ministers. This gave the appearance that Arabs were in charge, though Britain was really running things from the shadows. The British were also concerned about developments in Transjordan. They were worried about the buildup of Hashemite forces in the region. During the Cairo conference, the British came up with several ideas, mostly from the mind of Winston Churchill. Yes that Winston Churchill. Churchill took advantage of the vague language of the Balfour Declaration and the Hussein McMahon correspondence. The Balfour Declaration promised British support in establishing a Jewish homeland in Palestine, while the Hussein McMahon correspondence promised an Arab kingdom in Arabia. But neither document defined the borders of these imaginary places. Using the Jordan River as a dividing line, Churchill suggested giving the lands west of the river to the Jews and the lands east of the river to the Arabs. Winston Churchill had another bright idea. Since he was already there, why not let Prince Abdullah temporarily rule Transjordan? T.E. Lawrence liked Churchill's plan. He added that since Abdullah was not from Transjordan, he'd have to rely on the British, making him easier to control. Prince Abdullah could also be used to contain the anti-French and anti-Zionist elements in Transjordan. And since Abdullah would only be a temporary ruler, Great Britain did not have to commit to supporting him. Once Abdullah was no longer useful, they could sweep him aside and replace him with someone else. Prince Abdullah accepted this proposal and agreed to rule Transjordan for six months. Winston Churchill also had a plan for Iraq. 
Why not make Prince Faisal the new king of Iraq? Churchill believed this would solve many of their problems. The Iraqis would be more inclined to follow a fellow Arab. Putting Faisal in Iraq would keep him out of trouble in Syria. And with Faisal in Iraq and Abdullah in Transjordan, the British could finally stop feeling guilty for the Sykes-Picot agreement. Winston Churchill was confident his plan would work out and everything would turn out just fine. In the next episode, everything turns out horrible.